I stand here before you wearing religious clothing that for some symbolizes oppression, but I'm not a priest. I'm a metropolitan community church pastor. And I know how much this look offends some, but I choose not to surrender religious symbols or religious language to any institution that oppresses women and minorities. And when I use God language, some people will assume I'm using it in a very narrow, traditional sense, and I'm not. When people tell me they don't believe in God, I ask them to describe the God they don't believe in. And I usually end up saying, I don't believe in that type of God either. <laughs> I believe that the beauty of nature and the wonder of the human body are not just chance. I believe that there's something behind it all, and I call that something God. Not an old white man with a beard ready to zap you when you do something wrong. <laughs> but a creative, loving presence, wishing to co-create with all of us an even better world. So if my look or my language initially bother you, I ask you to hang in with me to see if what I have to say might comfort you or challenge you even more. So here goes. I get teary-eyed whenever a rainbow flag is raised. I rejoice whenever there's an advancement for the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender community. I celebrate whenever a celebrity comes out or another country approves equal marriage. However, I know that there are millions of LGBT people all over the world longing to be part of a spiritual community longing for a faith in a loving and accepting God, and wanting the freedom to be who they really are. And yet, they're constantly pressured to choose between their spirituality and their sexuality. And no one should have to make that choice. And yet, that choice is forced upon them by their faith communities, by their families, and by their governments. Deny who you are. Give up the hope for love. Certainly don't push for equal rights. And then maybe you'll be allowed to stay. Everyone should have the opportunity and the equal rights to love their God, to love themselves, and to love the person that they choose. Now I know that being forced to choose your spirituality over who you are is not unique to the LGBT community. Women, people in interfaith relationships, or people who just want to question some beliefs are also forced to make that choice. I remember the pain when I first began to discover that I was different, and I didn't have the words to describe that difference. I remember an incident when I was very young, some guys were playing basketball, and they were joking about homosexuals. And I asked one of them, what's a homosexual? And he said, go look it up in the dictionary. And I did, and the next day I told him it was about two men or two women who love each other or attracted to each other. And I said, I think that's me. And I remember him picking me up, and setting me on a fence post, and he said, that's evil and sick. Don't you ever tell anyone that. So I began to learn what other people thought about my feelings. At a very young age, I became involved in a Christian church, and God became my best friend. But I soon began to wrestle with, why, if God loved me, why would God do this to me? And in my teenage years, I regularly prayed that God would take away the attraction. But they never went away. And so I became very afraid that I was going to be alone the rest of my life, that I would never feel love or express love, that if my family found out, they would disown me, and my church would kick me out. So I believed I had to make a choice between my spirituality and my sexuality. How could I love myself if my church and my God hated who I really was? The church was saying I was sinful, the law was saying I was a criminal, and psychiatry was saying I was sick. Now, while this has changed in some places, in most of the world, it hasn't changed. 
I believe that God loves us unconditionally. I believe that there's nothing that you can do to cause God to love you more. And nothing you can do to cause God to love you less. It's like we live in this bubble of love all the time. And yet, we don't recognize it because of what society and faith communities throw at us. We're constantly being told, you're not worthy enough. You're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not holy enough. Well, if it's true that God loves us unconditionally, then it's time we started to love ourselves unconditionally. And that involves accepting your own differences and forgiving your own mistakes. It means loving yourself not in spite of your differences, but because of your differences. The uniqueness you bring into the world is your gift to the world. My uniqueness is that I'm gay. Yours might be body type or differing abilities or whatever. One definition of spirituality is the belief that there's something more than the physical universe. And the expression and experience of spirituality will be unique to each one of us. We just see things differently. When I see a sunset, I see God. When an atheist sees the same sunset, they see the laws of nature. Both are correct. So when you claim your spirituality, remember that other people will claim spiritualities different from yours. They just see things differently. One of the main beliefs of our church is that there are many paths to God, and Christianity is one of them. I hope that when you claim your spirituality, that you will also find a spiritual home that will accept you and your uniqueness. Find one or create one. A faith community at its best is one where you can explore life's big questions. Why are we here? Is there life after death? How can we be more forgiving and more generous? It's the place that challenges us to be open to new ideas, that calls us to care for each other in difficult times. It's a place that encourages us to be more engaged with loving ourselves and loving our neighbors. We all can benefit from this kind of a faith community where we can explore our own unique spirituality in the company of others while bringing our whole selves, including our sexuality. I was told a story, and I was told it was a true story, about a, a three-year-old girl who, when her parents said they were going to have another baby, she got really excited, and she said, can I talk to the baby by myself? A few months later, when the Parents bring the baby home. She's all excited. Can I talk to the baby by myself? So the parents place the baby in a crib, and they go into the next room and listen on the monitor. And they hear the little girl walk up to the crib, and she said to the baby, Would you tell me about God I've almost forgotten? You see, I believe we come from God. And that at birth, we begin a natural process of independence. We naturally begin to... Breathe on our own, eat on our own, think on our own, walk on our own. And we begin to move away from our source. And when we find a spiritual community and claim our spirituality, we can return again, connect again to the source that we come from. One of the sayings that guides me in life is dwell on the positives while you deal with the negatives. And while it's certainly true, we have a lot of work to do. It's also true that we have really come a long way. In 1981, I was at a demonstration and I was held by two police officers and beaten by a third. And because the violence continued to increase, I went on a 25-day hunger strike, protesting the relationship between the police and the LGBT community. Fast forward 30 years. And a young man goes to his dad and says that he and his girlfriend want to get married, but they don't know anyone to do the wedding. The dad said, you know Brent. Ask Brent to do the service. That dad was the chief of police of Toronto. <laughs> we have come a long way. In 2001, I married the first gay and lesbian couples anywhere in the world. Because of the death threats, I had to wear a bulletproof vest. 
I was assaulted that morning in church. There were 50 police officers in the basement of the church. And I was protected by 12 bodyguards, some of the toughest looking lesbians you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> and one gay man coordinating it all. <laughs> but there were protesters outside, and the weddings proceeded without incident. But the government of the day refused to recognize them, so we took them to court. Our case was joined with other cases, and we won. And that's how Canada became the first country in the world to have a legal same-sex wedding. We have come a long way. In 2007... <laughs> In 2007, I received a phone call from the office of the Governor General of Canada telling me that a selection committee headed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court had selected me to receive the Order of Canada, our country's highest honor for my work in the LGBT community. And while that certainly symbolizes we have come a long way, frankly, it was also made possible because I chose to embrace both my spirituality and my sexuality. So now I have the words to describe who I am, and I feel blessed to be who I am. And I hope that you, too, can get to that place of loving yourself, including your uniqueness, claiming your spirituality, and finding your spiritual home. So here we are today. I'm an openly gay man talking to you about spirituality and sexuality, saying it's okay to be gay. And yet there are nearly 70 countries in the world where everyone in this room, gay or straight, would be arrested just for attending this talk. And in 10 of those countries, those of us who are gay or lesbian would be executed. And every few minutes of every single day, another transgender person is murdered. And so we have a lot of work to do to make sure that everyone has a safe place and can find a spiritual home. And that may mean taking risks. It may mean speaking up to a friend. It may be challenging bullying or confronting bigotry wherever you find it. Sexuality is a gift from God. And yet most faith communities are very sex negative. And that sex negative attitude has led to hatred and violence towards sexual minorities. Discriminatory laws, self-hatred, and even suicide. On the one hand, you have your spirituality. On the other hand, you have your sexuality or whatever that uniqueness is. You don't have to give up one over the other. It's time for us to take back power over our own spirituality and take back power over our own sexuality and stop letting religious institutions or religious leaders force us to choose one over the other because guess what? We can embrace both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.